unpacking data. So we'll be talking about visualizations, specifically real-time visualizations um, connected to Twitter data. Um, just a little background on me. I, I actually left this, up, this slide blank on purpose because I know me, so I'll talk about me. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about my, you know, complete background, my CV, Patrick Dudas at LinkedIn, not in there. Um, I'm actually a fifth-year PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I've been teaching there now for the last, last four years um, at their Human Factors course, which is basically an HCI course. Um, I recently, actually, uh, June of 2012, I started a position at the Department of Defense, specifically at the Naval Coast Graduate School, um, where I helped develop a real-time Twitter analysis tool. Um, and the funny thing is, actually, when I signed up, or when I actually started working there in June uh, 2012, um, we, my contract for them was actually supposed to stop September 30th, uh, a couple weeks ago. And I'd like to say that the day after that, the government actually shut down. So apparently, <laughs> I was kind of important to them. Um, I am no longer working with them because of that, that sort of simulation. But um, today, I will be talking, like I said, about, mostly about visualizations and sort of the things that you have to think about when it comes to real-time visualizations. Um, I run actually a meetup group. And if you've never heard of this, it's called meetup.com. Uh, Meetup.com is actually a, w a wonderful resource to see other people or other groups that might have some similar interests to, towards yours. Um, I host the Data Visualization Group, and actually, um, we even though you kind of see the word data and you see visualization, everyone kind of thinks it's more of a technical kind of uh, meetup group. I don't actually like to just call it a technical group. Um, it actually involves a lot of people from the art community as well. You can understand visualizations, art, kind of go hand in hand. Um, the UI, UX sort of division as well, um, which actually goes into how people interact with a visualization and how uh, we should design for that. Um, the data side, and then there's the coding side as well. So it sort of encompasses a bunch of different things at the one. I do talk about a lot of some code in this actual uh, talk today. So if you're interested in the code, um, you can actually go to GitHub, do this PM. Um, you can actually find all the code that I've actually utilized at the data visualization meetup and also all the code that I'll be using today as well. So you don't have to kind of sit there and type you know, frantically just to kind of keep up with what I'm talking about. Let me first break down the differences between um, these different types of graphics. Um, there's infographics, there's models, and then there's visualizations. Infographics um, tend to be something that you kind of print out. They're static copies of something um, that you kind of, basically what you utilize them for is you print them out, you give them to your boss, your boss says, good job, I'll give this to the other people and we're going to look great because you have this neat little picture that sort of encompasses all your data into one neat little piece of paper. Um, but again, this is sort of a static look at how graphics are made and you can't really do anything with it other than just look at it and there's, you can't actually add any new data to it unless you update the actual images. Modeling um, actually looks at a system or sort of a uh, in this case, an organism uh, that is actually trying to visualize that information and actually allow somebody to sort of manipulate and sort of change that object as well. This uh, model here is actually for a project called Foldit. Um, if you've not heard of it, it's out of the University of Washington. Um, it's a wonderful game that is actually being utilized for looking at protein synthesis. Um, this is actually a protein itself, amino acid, and people actually try to rotate them and move them into position to gain points, but it actually helps the uh, medical community as well. Visualizations are actually built on data. Data is mainly your main component when it comes to visualizations. Um, and also visualizations in themselves are supposed to be interactive. Um, just to give you sort of a case in point, and I'm going to be doing this a lot, switching between here and online stuff, so... But basically what you're looking at is sort of this, this uh, looking at the data, allowing it to sort of represent itself. So based on what I have here is just some random data points here. I made some circles to sort of illustrate location. Um, and with interactive sort of visualizations, you want to have sort of a component that allows you to see that there's something here that is able to either be moved or manipulated. So in this case, when I hover over my mouse, I see that the cursor changes and there's sort of a change in the outline of the actual object. I can interact with it. So when I click on something, something happens. And eventually what you'll have is a situation where your data is supposed to sort of tell the story of the actual graphic itself. And then eventually it resets itself. So nothing too fancy there. Mm -hmm. 
So I've gone through that. Number one question I always get when it comes to working with visualization is, I have this data, what visualization or graphic should I make with it? Um, in this case, I have a random sampling of data here, and if you were interested in trying to look and relate them to each other, what you can actually do is just normalize it. So all I did was I added all the numbers together, and then I divided by that number, which I think was like 188, and divided by that number. And what you actually get in terms of what is the correct visualization is the pie chart. And if you've uh, ever sort of looked into graphics or visualizations in, uh, in particular, the pie chart is not really liked in the community, uh, simply because it's kind of hard to t tell like proportionality between one sector and another sector. Um, so even though this is the data and this is the best way to represent it, it's not usually the best for practice. There are lots of different ways to actually visualize information. Um, here are some of the more um, well-known types of visualizations, and they do work, work well in real-time environments. This is called a steam graph. And actually, let me show it in action. See, the steam graph actually has been utilized before with Twitter data. And let me show you how it works here. So what they actually did, there was actually a project that um, um, I was looking at before when it comes to looking at Twitter data, and what they used was a steam graph. And what a steam graph actually does is when you update it, you can see sort of the sort of proportionality sort of change and shift and move position. And these changes in moving the position is actually supposed to tell you new information. Um, what they actually did was they were looking at Twitter. They picked, I think, about maybe between uh, 20 and 30 different words, and every word had their own little color. And so what you could see was over time, there was a change in the graph, which means more people were tweeting about it. Back to this. Sparklines is actually um, a very well-known uh, visualization uh, developed by uh, Edward Tufte. And Edward Tufte, if you don't know that name, um, and then you're interested in visualizations and graphs and uh, arts when it comes to computer animated graphics, is a wonderful name to look up. Um, read his books. He's a wonderful. He's, uh, he has been doing this for a long time, and he's. Been he actually goes around now and does classes about visualizations. But um, this is actually called Sparklines. Um, and the idea is that instead of having to get all the information along the line, why don't we just compare a bunch of things and you can kind of just see and look at the differences based on uh, these very small sort of sparks. And that's where it came up with Sparklines. Finally, tree maps. Um, this is actually great for hierarchical data and sort of making sure that it actually formats to a, a particular screen. What I have here is actually three different plots that actually tell the same sort of story. Um, unfortunately, the data is different in each one, but they both they all represent the same thing. Um, this is all basically multi-dimensional data. So you have more than just your X and your Y, or maybe even your Z. You have four types of data here. In this one, we have it looks about 16 points, and here we have tons, tons of different types of data. And the idea is to allow somebody to visualize this information and tell the difference between multiple types of information. So in this case, um, this was, I believe this was uh, crime rates uh, within different types of cities. Um, and looking at this, you can sort of see the different areas, and you can immediately see a difference between different types of cities. Um, again, this, all this information is actually represented the same exact way, uh, excuse me, differently, but in the same exact type of medium. So back to my original question of what is, I have this data, what do I do with it? Your best bet is actually to work with a user or experts themselves. Um, usually if somebody comes to me and says, I have this data and I'm interested in building a visualization, how do I actually do it um, or which type I should actually use? What I usually tell them is, how would your users want to see this information? Would they want to see it sort of in this sort of approach? Is this simplistic enough for them? Do they want to see this where they can sort of compare different types of information very quickly, or are they looking for a more obtuse sort of way of looking at that information? So don't always say, I have this data, and I'm going to just push it into here. The package that I actually utilize is called d3.js. It's an online application, JavaScript library. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, it's actually, um, the precursor to this is called Protoviz, and it's now called d3. It is D3 because it's a data-driven document. So it's already telling us that the data is sort of dictating where the location of objects are 
and sort of just how to interact with that data. So um, if you're interested, I will. Uh, there is a listing here of over 1,900 different types of D3 uh, visualizations that are out there. Um, I'll try to get this, uh, make this a little bit more public somehow because I know you can't probably don't want to copy this word for word, but um, it is um, sort of a, a way of sort of showing how they actually, you know, there's different types of visualizations you can make out of D3. D3 uses something um, called SVG graphics. Um, it's actually scalar, uh, scalable vector graphics. Um, this is actually different than most images that you see online. If you've ever seen an image online, you have a situation where it's just maybe a picture, so it's a JPEG of some sort. SVG is actually built on this idea of having points, lines, and polygons. <coughs> so you have an XY coordinate, and then you can just place your point, line, and polygons on that, that XY coordinate. So in this case, let me just to showcase the differences between the two. Um, Um, there we go. So this is the image, and this is just a JPEG. And so what happens is, if you actually scroll, scroll into this object, you see that the picture sort of starts deteriorating over time. It's because there's pixels there, and all you're doing is sort of just getting closer and closer and closer into that image. When it comes to this SVG, or Scalable Vector Graphics, these objects actually can be remade because I can just change my XY coordinates. So if I zoom into this, I actually find my object. It still mm -hmm. sort of uh, holds on to its original shape, but I can zoom in as far as I want. It's not going to change because I'm just increasing the XY coordinates. And why this is actually really, really nice and something that, that should be utilized more often, it's for the fact that this is actually malleable to um, my screen here, to this projector. I can put it on a cell phone, I can put it on a tablet. And it sort of uh, allows somebody to zoom or sort of uh, manipulate that object and so to actually see clearly no matter what. And what is this called again? This is called uh, SVG. It's a scalable vector graphic. It's just a little bit, it's different than your traditional JPEG or PNG files. Can you, can you tell us about file sizes for that versus? Actually, uh, these are usually tend to be smaller um, because with a JPEG, you have to know every single pixel and have information on every single pixel. In this case, I just need to know the points along the outside of this penguin and sort of just the color coloring here. So all I know is I need to know just this object. That's it. Whereas if I had this as a JPEG, I would have to know, even though these are all blank you know, blank spaces, you have to sort of retain that information. So um, it depends on what graphic you're looking at, but typically they're actually smaller than JPEG files themselves. Next question, why would we save anything as a JPEG? Um, I think it's just that if we traditionally, especially when we're taking pictures like with you know traditional meanings of uh, digital, you know, we take pictures, it's digital, it comes up as JPEG, we're sort of, the internet was built on the JPEG and PNG and GIF files and things of that nature. I'm um, hoping over as HTML5 becomes more and more proponent in sort of a commercial use that mm -hmm. SVG graphics would be utilized more often. We run into this all the time with putting something in a media, like you have an image, but we want to put it on that. Billboard, so therefore, if it's not you know, super high resolution, it, you can't use it yeah. for that purpose. But this apparently you could blow the billboard size and you wouldn't lose any detail. Exactly, because all you're doing is recreating. So, um, you know, you sort of have, like I said, you have these well, X, Y coordinates for all these values of this, this image here. Um, if I have my little X, Y coordinates here, and I want to make this bigger, I just double this. So. And then just reposition everything. So, bada boom, bada bing, you have a larger. <laughs> one thing um, I want to talk about there's actually two different things that I specifically want to talk about. Um, one is called saliencies, and one is called change blindness. Um, I hope that, if nothing else, you kind of learn a little bit about visualizations in general before I kind of go into the more of the, the real time information. But these are two key factors in trying to make sure that if somebody sees your visualization, they actually interact with it and they know how to interact with it. My example here is the original Mario. I'm sure everybody here has probably seen this at some point in their lives. Um, this was actually designed, um, let me put it this way. Games nowadays, if you ever play a video game, you have a situation where you'll start the game 
and you're told that the X button does this, the Y button does this, and you push this button to do this action. Here, you're not actually given any information. You're just told Mario starts over here, you're supposed to get somewhere on the left hand side. This was designed specifically to allow somebody to, to first understand that if um, there's two actions involved, this includes walking and jumping. And so you immediately you know, try to get that coin. So you hit that, you jump up, you hit your head on that block, and you get a coin out of that. And then you, the, actual, the, loop, the user actually learns through actually doing this operation that they actually can sort of manipulate objects within um, this given sort of a, this graphic, if you will, the video game itself. So this is actually a great sort of example of just allowing somebody to sort of be immersed into a world and then allow them to sort of learn as they're actually doing. The next idea is called change blindness. And this is actually one of the most crucial aspects of real-time visualization. If you can imagine looking at a real-time visualization, your data is always changing, uh, specifically if you're looking at Twitter data. Um, what I have here, um, Basically, I'm going to show an image on here, uh, and what it's going to be is going to, there's going to be there's going to be an image, a blank slide, and a change in the image, and then another blank slide. So it's just going to keep recycling through this. And I would actually like to try this out. So I'm going to play the video. It's a little, small little gift. It's going to take about you know, very short. And I just want people to tell me. When they can actually see the difference between slide number one and slide number three, if you will. So if you want to raise your hand and let me know when you can see the difference, I would appreciate it. I only do this for a few seconds because you could be here all day. Yes, okay. If you don't see it, it's there. <laughs> so as you can as you can see from that scene, even though I'm just looking at two different objects and two different images, that blank slide in between sort of messes with you to a point where you can't even notice a pretty significant difference between one slide and another slide. This is actually very crucial in the sense that if I have a visualization that is running in real time, if I show them one image and then I have to re re recreate it and put it on another image, you're probably going to miss the differences between stage number one and stage number two. So you need to make sure that there's some sort of mechanism to make this a smooth transition from one to the next. To the next. And again, going back to the D3 package, this is actually something that's, that you're able to do. So you can actually see information sort of change and the visualization sort of change, but gradually. All right, so Twitter. That is the majority of what the project is built on. Twitter is a wonderful resource when it comes to actually finding other resources. Um, I'll be very, uh, I'll kind of go over the idea of what a Twitter is and whatnot, but um, Twitter was born in 2006. Um, it was when uh, one of the founders was sitting outside on a park bench um, trying to send a message to, a uh, text message to one of his friends. Um, and so th that was why it was limited to 140 characters and it's still the same today. Um, the name was actually because there was, um, there was actually a bird that was actually there <laughs> when they were, um, he was actually giving this message. So he was talking about, uh, tweeting or talking, like sort of talking like a bird. And the name actually stems from, uh, at that time, Flickr was very popular, so they tried to make something similar to it. So originally it was T-W-T-T-R, and eventually became Twitter. OK, so you're interested in collecting data from Twitter. How do you do this? There's two types of ways to do this. One is historically, and one is more in real time. Historic data is something where you're looking over a long stretch of time and looking at basically every and all topics, maybe in a given area. And this is actually how people in research typically get their data when it comes to doing any kind of um, sort of analysis with Twitter itself. Real time, obviously, is more instant. You can have more, more specific keywords to get specific information. And it's actually not utilized too often. To give you an idea of perspective of how historic data is collected, imagine this stream here is Twitter. So we have tweets that are going around and kind of being, you know, thrown throughout the air and whatnot, you know, basically from all parts of the world. You have some guy that kind of sits there with a net and says, okay, I'm interested in this time frame at this location. Usually this person is actually not a person, but it's actually more of a computer. And they just take a big old net and they throw it out there. 
and they get all this data, and they kind of take it back and they say, okay, let's do, let's do our analysis. At this point, we have all these tweaks and whatnot, and what you have to actually do is basically called noise removal. It's basically looking at outliers within your data to remove that information and actually have a usable list of information. To give you an example of this, um, back in 2010, the Egyptian Revolution, this data was collected, this is over a million tweets, and what they were interested in was looking at visualizing this information and seeing who the key players were tweeting this information. This looks great. This looks like something where we have large groups here, we have these clusters here. Useful information. The only issue is this whole section right here was talking about Miley Cyrus because she had mentioned a tweet and it got retweeted a lot. So this is actually useless information. We're not actually their main point of interest was actually that one thing right there. So it's not the best when it comes to understanding the entire Egyptian revolution. It was mostly looking at just a bunch of noise, then having a little bit of information that's usable. Twitter provides uh, an API that is available to the public. Anybody can use it. And it actually has two different mechanisms that you can use. One is called the search API. One is called the stream API. The search API is actually um, quite easy to, to use. Um, and I'll show an example of this when, once I get to a little bit farther along here. But the idea is this. A user just sends a query to Twitter saying, I'm interested in this keyword at this location. And then Twitter says, OK, you can have the last 100 responses to that sort of request. You get the response back in something called a JSON file. Um, it's just a, um, if you've ever heard of XML, um, it's basically sort of a shorthand of XML. So it's just, just how they sort of give you back the information. And this process just continues over and over again. User sends requests, Twitter creates these requests, Twitter sends back response. You can't kind of get the good pointer at this point. The actual stream API um, is kind of, kind of nifty. What you do is you create a client, create something, and you attach it to the whole Twitter stream. And you set your parameters. Let's say you know, you're interested in the keyword um, PodCamp in the area of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And as all the, twi the tweets of the world go through it, it says, OK, if you meet my criteria, I'm going to push that information to your computer or your, your, your application. The only issue with this is the fact that for everyday users, you only get 1% of the tweets. If you pay a little bit of money, you can get 10%. And at the low, low cost of $500,000, you can have Ooh. the entire tweet stream. So not usually feasible for most people when it comes to a budget. So here's the difference between the two sort of mechanisms. Um, search API, you have about 450 requests you can do per about 15 minutes. You only get 100 back. And you can actually specify you know, a, a geolocation, an actual location. And for the stream API, again, our <laughs> um, you're sort of limited to how many times you can actually connect to the stream, uh, limited information, and also you can kind of um, you can basically pull around like 47,000 tweets per hour using using their stream API. So what I'm going to show you, and again, um, if you go to my GitHub uh, coding, you can see uh, you can have that you can have the code for, you know if you're interested in looking at it. Um, what you actually need to get a Twitter stream or Twitter um, code from directly from Twitter. And all you actually need is a Twitter account, a very, 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 very limited Python skills, um, and then just you have to set up a Twitter API account. So let me show you this really quickly. It's dev.twitter.com. You go to this website. You create, a, you create an account, and then you create an application. And all that requires you to do is go into My Applications, and then create a new application. So pretty straightforward. Um, this one. Here you're going to get a lot of stuff. And the only thing you really care about is um, right here. Basically, these are the only four points of information you need from this, 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 uh, from the Twitter API. Once you have this, and all you need to do is copy and paste this information, 
you can actually start collecting data from Twitter. Let me go to our code here. So here's my here's my Python file that I created. And again, this is available on GitHub under Davis PM. All you have to do is to put in those four keys of information and then whatever search query that you're interested in. So that's your keyword or hashtag or whatever you're interested in looking up. And plug, it in, plug that information in here. And that'll start actually printing data from Twitter itself. So it's not a lot of code to actually get you started on this. Um, again, all you have to do is set up a Twitter API account with them. And then you can start collecting data from there. Um, so, and if it doesn't work, make sure you have, you know, make sure you're looking at the uh, correct authentication keys, which I kind of just pointed out there, um, and then make sure you have a Twitter account, and then um, make sure you're utilizing the, the Python code sort of to provide it to you. Okay, so I've talked enough about sort of Twitter, and now I want to try to connect that back to uh, the visualization. And this project that we were, I was interested in, worked on, and helped develop. It's called Dynamic Twitter Network Analysis. The mechanism for this was actually user provides some keyword or address, sends the, the request to Twitter, and Twitter basically talks back and forth to my application and then visualizes the information from there. The idea was that the project was built on HTML5 standards, which is sort of um, the newer characteristics of HTML5, or excuse me, HTML. It was uh, ubiquitous on um, all platforms. And it actually utilized UTF and Unicode, which is basically all languages that are available, not just um, sort of just to a specific character language, but all, all languages. It was meant to be sort of a, a, create, a sort of a cooperative platform so you can create large projects and have multiple users utilizing it, or just setting up a single process, single project in itself. And the types of networks you can actually create from Twitter aren't just limited to user-to-user -user connections. Let me give you an example here. James tweets, just saw at Danny at hashtag Pittsburgh, hashtag library, checked out this book, and it gives a URL. We actually, we were interested in looking at four different types of networks. We have our traditional user-to-user, -user, so from James to Danny, user-to-hashtag, so Pittsburgh, James to Pittsburgh, James to library, and then hashtag-to-hashtag, Pittsburgh's library, and then James to the link itself. And let me talk about these last two real quickly here. These types of networks are actually not utilized too often when it comes to social network analysis, and, but they actually kind of give a different story to the whole thing. Not only are we interested in kind of looking at who's talking to who on Twitter, but we're also interested in the context as well. You can imagine this. Say you're looking at a bunch of different tweets in Pittsburgh about libraries. All these tweets are coming in, and you're learning, and you, you basically you start off with having just Pittsburgh the library. You're almost building like an ontology or sort of this connection of different types of hashtags or contexts sort of, sort of connected together. So hashtag to hashtag sort of gives you new words to actually search when you're, you're kind of looking at, um, looking at Twitter specifically. Username to URL is actually kind of a cool mechanism to find other types of information that's sort of pushed into Twitter. What people tweet on, tweet on Twitter is actually not always useful, but you can connect different sort of applications to Twitter, specifically like Instagram, Foursquare, Facebook, all these uh, types of you know, other social networking sites. You can actually tie into Twitter. And being able to find out where other types of information are, uh, maybe even like YouTube, is a great sort of a mechanism to have available to you. So again, looking at just what not only who's tweeting the information, but maybe a URL attached to that information is useful as well. Um, let me actually show a small little demo of what I'm talking about here. And this is the application. And if you have any questions while I'm kind of, kind of going through this, I'll be happy to answer them about the software. Um, but what I'd like to actually show is some types of, you know, types of networks that are sort of being built from this information, and also different ways you can actually visualize that information coming from Twitter. 
So I actually created a project for um, Plot Camp in Pittsburgh. So let's go over here and select that project. And I'm able to put in specific locations. So and then I'm looking at PC, PGH, and PodCamp Pittsburgh 8 as well. Okay, so this is basically the network that I'll be utilizing. And what I want to actually talk about is sort of how this information sort of changes as new information is sort of appended. So right now, these are just a bunch of different people that have talked about PodCamp Pittsburgh, and if they utilize sort of, if they were talking to somebody else. So you sort of see the communication information. So right now there are probably people talking about PodCamp because we're right here right now. And you can actually see as these conversations sort of unroll, who they're actually talking to and I'm seeing if that changes at all. Um, if you see there's actually some color changes here. What this is is actually there was a clustering algorithm and then the different clusters are dictated by the different colors themselves. Looking at this at sort of a larger scale. Download this and talk at the same time. Um, again, this is sort of looking at sort of how people, when people are tweeting. This new information is updating the visualization. There's also another mechanism to look at information, specifically at network type information. It's a program called Gephi. Gephi is available, it's an open source project. You're able to download it for free um, and then look at it, sort of utilizing it for your own types of social networking if you're interested. So I just downloaded that, let me look at it real quick. Anyways, um, it's a wonderful platform because it allows you to sort of look and change the sort of the layout of the structure. The layout of the structure, um, there are some different types of clustering algorithms that are available built in. And you can actually, uh, okay, there we go. So let me open this up real quick here. So I was actually collecting this data for a couple days now just to make, kind of, um, sort of you know, have something to present today uh, for the actual demonstration. And so what I actually collected was about 175 different uh, people or tweets themselves and 307 connections between them. So some of they're, they're communicating between one another. So here is my network. And this is just a network of communication that I've sort of looked at at Twitter, um, specifically for, for PodCamp. And what I'll do is I'll just show you real quickly um, just how to format this data within Gephi because I think it is a great application to look at and see uh, visually if you're interested in trying to see network structures in general. So this network structure sort of uh, is formed by the communication and actually let's take a look here at it's a little smaller. Zoom in. So obviously the most central person is going to be PC uh, PGH, and you can see sort of who's communicating with whom um, at a scale of just uh, basically talking about this particular pod camp. Again, um, this is something that can be utilized, and it's an open source project um, that is available to, to actually look at different types of, you have different types of filters, um, different uh, types of um, weighting between different types of nodes. Um, but again, this is just looking at information more, uh, in, more in a historic sense. Um, but it allows you to sort of see the whole network structure at once. Okay. Going back to finish things up here with the presentation. So I already kind of showed this. This is sort of the major layout, the, the layout structure that we're looking at. One thing I, I want to mention, and I sort of mentioned this earlier, is this idea of saliencies. So there's actually some information that's built in naturally into a network structure. Again, how people sort of communicate with one another if they're in a tight sort of connection that's considered a cluster. So these clusters are all sort of color coded so you can easily discern themselves from one another. So um, probably, hypothetically, these people probably know each other and are communicating with each other. Um, this group here, this group here, and then you have some stragglers that are kind of just kind of talking to one another person about a, a specific topic. 
um, you can bias sort of the interconnection versus the interconnection, so they're, all, they're also a little tightly connected. And then you can also highlight and sort of look at first connection. So if I highlight it over this, it would show the whole network structure. But if I highlight over this, this instance here, it'll only highlight these ones because it's the only thing that it's connected to. Let me show this to the time. Right. Um, what you're interested in actually is looking at, if I'm looking at this network structure, you know, and I start with this initial query, it would be nice to actually change it up a little bit to sort of adapt to maybe a new situation. In this case, um, this was, again, this was used, uh, utilized uh, for, for government affairs. We were looking at home Syria, a uh, major city in Syria, and we were looking at FSA, which stands for the Free Syrian Army. And so the network structure was being built. We saw that there was a very large node here um, looking at context. And we saw that you know there was another hashtag that you might want to utilize. So you can actually select that node and I'm actually start building the query based on FSA and on Siri as well. So the actual interaction, the visual layout of the network, plus sort of the visual cues, allow you to sort of see that this part is sort of interesting, and then I can interact with it as well. Again, I sort of already talked about Gephi, um, but looking at a large scale of information, uh, we were able to sort of export all this information to different platforms. Um, Payak and Palmetier being the more popular ones that are available um, uh, for, for use when it comes to looking at network structures. And then looking at timeline information. So you might be interested in looking at how the network structure sort of forms over time. This work. So we had a little timeline thing, so timeline structure. So you can actually see how the network structure was being built over a given stretch of time. And it's interesting to see once you kind of start maybe a specific hashtag or uh, one person in general, how this retweet mechanism actually works. Um, and this is sort of our way of sort of illustrating this. Um, let's say you started with one smaller, smaller clusters, and all of a sudden it sort of expands very rapidly. And usually it's exponentially as well. Again, um, you can sort of see the coloring changes, so you can see where the, the dense groups are. Um, but also you can sort of see who the main players are as well in the, the actual layout. Um, the final thing I really wanted to mention was um, different types of taking Twitter data and actually utilizing it in different mechanism. If you're interested in social network analysis at all, and you're interested in trying to find a career in social networking, sentiment analysis is a huge thing right now. Um, and this is basically saying we have all this publicly made information. Um, I want to be able to look at it sort of and see how people actually feel about a certain topic. Um, you can understand like um, if you're interested in looking at the Pittsburgh Steelers right now, the majority of the sentiment is probably going to be very negative at this point, uh, versus the Pittsburgh Pirates, where it's going to be very positive at this point. But getting an understanding of how globally, if you will, how information from Twitter is coming out and looking at how it's sort of attached to either a positive or a negative sort of sentiment is a very powerful mechanism. Um, another visualization that we developed um, is this, basically this ring structure. We took um, this word list from, it's called a new. It's a word list of around 2,000 words, and they range from very, very, very positive, which is a positive five, all the way down to very negative, which is a negative five. So you have sort of this polarity between very negative and very positive. We put it on a ring structure, so you can kind of see as you put tweets into here, they're going to be pulled to one side or the other side. The unofficial name of this that I came up with was actually called mood ring. That was kind of clever. Um, <laughs> So the idea is that you could sort of understand that as this new information was coming into Twitter, it was getting either pulled to one side or the other side, and how it sort of changes over time itself. Um, some of the negative characteristics, um, obviously things like sad, murder, WTF, and kill. Um, motive runs as well. The funny thing is the fact that we were interested in looking at sentiment analysis at different, at different countries like the Philippines and Syria. Unfortunately, this word list would not work because they're not, you know, correct languages, let's put it that way. And there's different contexts utilizing these words in different countries. The only thing that actually remain consistent is emoticons. Emoticons are the only things that are actually consistent worldwide when it comes to understanding sentiment. 
So those are actually very powerful tools. If you actually ever apply them to Twitter, they're actually very powerful to use for sentiment analysis. So kind of wrapping things up here, um, this was sort of like looking at, you can see nodes here. As more tweets came in, you can sort of see how it's being pulled to one side or the other. Um, but it's sort of a different type of visualization to allow you to sort of understand not only how people are, what are people are talking about or how it's being communicated, but the actual sentiment that's sort of attached to that Twitter message. Um, I do hope there's some questions for maybe specifically this project that I worked on or with visualizations in, in general. Um, but I'll be happy, or Twitter, if you're interested in any questions. I spent a lot of time working with Twitter, so I kind of know a lot of the ins and outs when it comes to Twitter. Um, actually, let me make one of the last little point about Twitter. Um, one of the key things that people are very interested in, see if I can jump to, is geocoded information. Geocoded information is looking at the latitude or longitude of the given tweet. Twitter has two mechanisms for finding your location when you have you tweet a message. Either you specify, I want this tweet to be geocoded, so whenever it's put out to the Twitter universe, everyone knows I'm exactly at this position. If you don't specify that information, it goes to your profile. Um, why this is kind of a little bit weird is the fact that either I have very exact information of where you're tweeting from, or I have to trust what you tell me in your profile. Um, to give an example of this is the fact that I was developing this project in Monterey, California, but my profile said I was still living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so if they were looking at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I was still showing up. So it's sort of a wide variety of granularity between having very, very exact data versus having very obtuse data. So that's just talking specifically about Twitter and how it sort of geolocates its information. But I do have a, I want to open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions about either visualizations or Twitter, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, then I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, you can come talk to me directly. I'll be around for the rest of the day. And I thank you very much.